I'm speaking English now because I want to introduce the next speaker and he is from Canada. Um, working with inclusion in higher education, it's necessary to search for inspiration from other countries and early adapters around the world. And we are so happy to have one of them with us today. Frederick Fauvet is one of the most important voices in developing inclusion and universal design in higher education. He has a unique background as an academic, researcher, as a disability officer, and as a consultant and inclusion specialist. Today, he will challenge the way we work with inclusion in higher ed and examine what is required to include diverse learners of the 21th century. In line with universal design of learning, he has told us that he would like to have questions during his presentation. So please don't hesitate to ask any questions in the chat. Okay, so Frederick, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thanks for the introduction. <laughs> uh, welcome everyone to this session. Uh, it's early morning for me, so I'm on a completely different day than you are, but uh, good afternoon to you. I'm sorry as well that my, my Norwegian is not up to scratch, so I have to do this in English uh, and, and defer from the other presenters on, on, the, on this uh, conference. So I am going to be with you for about an hour. We're aiming for about 50 minutes, and I'm going to try and make this as interactive as possible, and then we're going to keep 10 minutes uh, at the end. But as Elena has said, she is monitoring uh, the chat. So if you do have uh, pressing questions during the, the presentation, I'm very happy to take them as we go to make this as conversational as possible. And the topic of what I'm going to talk about today is exploring the needs of sustainable, of sustainable whole campus approaches to the inclusion of diverse learners. And before we begin, I'd like to acknowledge the fact that the World Roads, where I work, uh, sits on the land of the Gustafsson and Lincoln families and communities, and stress that uh, a large part of the work that we do in Canada in education uh, focuses on integrating the ways of knowing, the ways of doing, and the ways of being of uh, Indigenous populations into our teaching learning research model. Um, and it's a, a task that is ongoing for the 21st century. And it's one where UDL has been, um, has been useful. So we might talk about this during the session. So a little bit about myself, Eleanor has introduced me already, so I'm not going to say too much, but just uh, wanted to say just enough so you understood what I drew from when I talked to you today. Um, so I have a multi-pronged sort of approach to inclusion because I've had several hats. Um, I have worked as the head of accessibility on a large Canadian campus uh, while I was doing my PhD. So for four years, I was working uh, as head of accessibility and doing a lot of work around universal design for learning. So I definitely have that perspective. But obviously, my trajectory was to eventually become faculty. Um, I'd been a teacher before and wanted to, to become a uh, you know, uh, prof in the faculty of education, which I did. I worked uh, in several places in Canada. And the only important thing to remember from this is that um, in all, both of these positions, so I've been assistant prof and associate prof now, um, I've been uh, called on to mentor and supervise contract, what we call contract faculty, so other instructors. Um, as sort of program head in one case and academic lead in the other. So that's given me that insight too. And how do we support uh, colleagues? How do we support faculty in, um, in looking at inclusion in, in changing their strategies in their teaching? Um, and I'm also a consultant. So I do a lot of work around uh, UDL and inclusion with post-secondary institutions, both locally, um, domestically and, uh, and internationally as well. So I'm gonna draw from all of these perspectives. And I think it does make my, my vision of inclusion slightly um, unique in the sense that um, I'm, I'm, not, I'm trying not to stay in the silo mentality and to look at this really from a multidisciplinary perspective. And that's what I'll be presenting to you today. Uh, format of the workshop so it's always hard you know i'm going to talk about inclusion i'm going to talk about accessibility i'm going to talk about universal design for learning but it's always a little hard to do this interactively in 50 minutes um you know and when so both because of the time element and because of the online uh, sort of uh, format as well but i've tried to incorporate uh, a lot of interaction as much interaction as we can so I, I'm going to ask you wherever you are, if you have a, your cell phone by you or another screen available, we're going to use Menti on two occasions. So you may want to go on to menti.com now so that you're ready and I'll generate a code for the activity when we eventually get there. I'm not going to share my screens because it gets a little messy, but um, I do have another computer. So I'm going to be talking to the results and uh, bringing them into uh, the presentation. I will also monitor social media. So um, I know conference will be using a hashtag universal 2021. 
So if you use that and my my tag as well, um, my handle FFOVE, um, I'll be able to continue the conversation with you. It's late for you, but it's really early for me. So I'm going to be available for, for most of the rest of the morning to discuss this. Uh, and I found a lot of participants do continue the conversation, so feel free. And at the end, as we've said, we've got about 10 minutes, uh, so we'll take questions as well, but you can engage with uh, you know, the, the questions during the presentation too. Uh, feel free to continue with me, so I say social media or email afterwards, and I will share the slides on LinkShare right after, and I share them through my LinkedIn account and my Twitter account, so you can go and pick them up there as well. And what I'll do is I'll um, add the Menti slides into the presentation so that you see all the interaction that um, you, you, um, you went through and carried out. Um, so I wanted to set a context before we begin on this 15-minute uh, conversation together. I think you would all agree we are on, on an, an unprecedented conjuncture in higher ed and further education because of the pandemic and because of the, the disruption that it has created. But I'm gonna to argue today that a lot of this disruption um, has been a long time coming and that it's sometimes easy to say, oh my God, higher education is in, uh, in is totally unsettled because of this year and a half of pandemic. I will argue that really um, it was unsettled before and that a lot of the crises that we have uh, going on now have been um, are coming for a while. And so therefore today we're gonna to try and dissect this tension and dissect the things that are not working to see how we might um, you know, to try to, um, to address them. Uh, in this conversation during the day, there's gonna be two poles sort of uh, perspectives, uh, which are explaining some of the tension we're seeing and why um, higher education is changing so much. On the one hand, we have an increased sort of neoliberal landscape um, by neoliberal, I mean that it, we're increasing looking at education as a market, as a, as a free market, as a competitive market, and that has accentuated some of the pressures on students and faculty. And that's really been with us for already a decade and is not going to go away. So we have to work within that model. On the other hand, we also have an unprecedented diversity in our learner population. Today, we're going to talk about students with disabilities, but we're also going to talk about international students, second language learners, first generation students. Uh, racialized students, indigenous students, um, you, you know, um, sexual uh, students uh, who are LGBTQ2S+, all of these students are in the spectrum of what we consider um, diverse learners, and we have to consider them when we look at inclusion in high ed as well. Um, so I hope that sets the, the, the tone and the scene, and this is the landscape on which I'm going to be uh, talking. Now, I'm looking more precisely at what are the objectives for the session. We're gonna look at what's not working currently in uh, higher education provisions for the inclusion of diverse learners. And I'll do a poll and involve you in that discussion. And then we'll look at what's really problematic. I find that's always necessary because there's no point talking to people about change unless you get them to acknowledge that what's, what they have at present isn't working. No one wants to change for the sake of, work, of, of changing, right? It can't be a process just in itself. It has to be situated in a context. Um, I think it's a lot easier for yourself, for your colleagues on your campuses, when you engage with these conversations on inclusion, to first take a look back and look at what is actually um, literally cracking, what's not working. And then people are much more accepting of change once they, um, they see the, the problems that they acknowledge. Once we acknowledge these problems, we're going to look at a sustainable um, framework for inclusion. And I stress the word um, sustainable, because whatever solution we offer our colleagues and our campuses, needs to work for the ongoing decade. And we'll see that that's one of the problems that really we're stuck with a historical model that's no longer sustainable. We can't just change to something that again is gonna be out of date and obsolete in a few years. We need to change towards something that is actually gonna be majorly um, different in the sense that it can address all of our needs for the coming decades in higher education. And I'm gonna suggest that UDL maybe is one of these, of these models. Um, I'm gonna take a little time to talk about this specific incentive that we have in the moment to look at UDL, and that's the pandemic setting. It's changed the landscape again, but it has changed the way instructors um, set up their class, and it's really created new challenges in terms of inclusion. So we'll take a little bit of time looking at that. Um, and then finally, we're going to look at the organizational dimension of this, because there's no point presenting models or presenting solutions unless you look at it strategically and look at the management of change process within institutions and see how we're going to do this because otherwise it remains conceptual you know in the ivy tower and it's not something that we can imply so that we can implement so we really have to take the time to look at what it might look like on terrain when you're trying to implement these changes on your campuses 
Okay, so we are going to try a Menti activity to get you interacting with me because otherwise I feel like I'm speaking to, to a blank screen. Um, so if you are a Menti, I'm going to generate a code for uh, the first activity. And the question I have for you is what is not currently working in, your, in our frameworks and processes around inclusion in higher ed? So taking the time to acknowledge uh, what is problematic at present. So if you bear with me, Menti is going to generate a code. So the code is 63. 071117. So I'll say it again 6307117. And you have it at the bottom in caption again. So um, it's going to be in a bubble format, and uh, I'm going to see your interaction. So if you'd like to, um, to go ahead and, and uh, send me your thoughts, I'm going to talk to them as they come up on the screen. And then I'll link those slides into the presentation so you can all see them as well once uh, once the talk is over. And then I'll and then after that I'll give you my uh, my feel of what maybe what's what's problematic at the moment. But I'd like to hear from you a little bit. So again, sixty three zero seven one 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 seven. And I'm going to give you a bit of time to type. Obviously, I hope we do get some interaction. There's a lot of you online, so hopefully we'll get a bit of a sample to feel feel the room. So someone boldly says the concepts of learning. That's yes. Time. It's one uh, something you know. So go ahead. I'm going to give you a few minutes. Good use of the human element, the social aspects of education. So talking about that fabric, right? The, the very philosophical approach to inclusion, interaction between teacher and students, not legislated. Um, and I know that within Lenore, we discussed this as we uh, planned for the session that um, even though Norway has very broad legislation, it doesn't have anything on the ground really in terms of practice. Motivation to change in ways to perform teaching inclusively, okay? Ownership, knowledge, time again. Time has come up three times now. So lots of great ideas, the lack of time again. So you all feel very, um, very pressed on that. Excellent. So in the interest of time, I'm going to continue, but it was interesting to see the room and, and get you to, uh, to interact a little bit. And I'll link all this to the PowerPoint uh, when I share it later on so that you can all see um, the thoughts that you all had. Time being one of the major elements and then relationship with students uh, and, and the, the lack of legislation. Um, so I'm going to give you an overview of what I see as being problematic. And I think I have uh, five elements here. And these are five elements that have been with me for a long time. I, I came up with these when I was working at McGill as uh, head of accessibility. Often I was sent into meetings, all sorts of meetings. You know, the five meetings, uh, five minutes that you have to offer to, to faculty council, the longer meetings of deans, an hour and a half. I had this elevator speech around inclusion that I was able to adapt to all of these environments. Um, and at first I had one or two arguments, uh, and then I worked through this process of triangulation of getting the feedback from the people in the room and, and adding to this, to this toolbox and to this uh, list of arguments, which grew from about two to about five. And then I, I stuck with these five, what I call those pillars for pretty much the rest of my, uh, you know, my work. And now I use it in my consulting work. So it has been sort of proved through this triangulation with different parties, not just um, accessibility folks or instructors, but administrators, students, unions, you know, I've, 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 I've done this presentation in front of a lot of, of different stakeholders, which means I've been able to tweak it and adapt it. And these are the five I, I keep coming back to. So for me, there's a an element of pertinence here because really it, it's the voice of the people involved that has led to this. So the first problem that we have at the moment is the demographics. Um, the systems that we have in place, I'm sure it's the same in Norway as it is in most uh, global North countries, have been in place since the 70s where we looked at diversity mostly in terms of impairment and disability and really in terms of a minority of students when you looked at numbers we're talking about one two percent of students that required very hands-on individualized interventions to be able to access higher education and there was nothing wrong with that system because while you looked at demographics of the sort it was 
totally adequate and possible to offer individualized learning with a small team of accessibility folks on the campus. Now, uh, what we see at the moment is uh, incredible explosion in the demographics, right? While I was in McGill, we, I started in 2011. I think we had about 600 uh, students using the services. By the time I left in 2015, we were at over 2000. So you see a threefold uh, explosion within four years. And this is something that we see in all North American campuses and I think pretty much worldwide in uh, the global North. So um, the very um, texture, the very canvas of diversity in Ireland has exploded, which means that we are working with uh, structures and processes that uh, were designed for a tiny minority of students. And now often we are dealing with a large proportion of our students. Now we have to stop and think of numbers. Sometimes even with students in uh, with impairments and disabilities, we think, what's, the, what's that ceiling? You know, how high will it keep climbing? Well, if you look at the University of Brighton in, in the UK, it has 10%, it's a large campus, and it has 10% of students registered with, with accessibility, 10% registered, who've gone through processes and have provided documentation. So we can sort of imagine that on most campuses, that would be the peak. Now add to that, uh, international students. On most North American campus, I don't know about Norway, but in most North American campus, we have 25% of students who are uh, international and second language learners. Often they experience barriers that are very, very similar, if not identical to the barriers experienced by students with disabilities. I just spoke about indigenous students in North America, we have, you know, two to 5% of indigenous students. If you add to that uh, lifelong learners and, and first generation learners, we have another five to 10% there. Now, we, if you add all of these percentage, you see that we've gone well over 50%. So we can really state that at the moment we are working in institutions where over 50% of students actually have a difficulty with access and uh, you know, are concerned about inclusion. And that really shows you how obsolete and, 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 and broken our systems are. Um, the diagnostic approach really has been the basis for inclusion, and really it's obsolete in many ways. First of all, uh, in the sense that, you know, again, if you went back to the 1700s and 80s, you mostly had students, when we talked about inclusion and diversity, we had students with physical impairment, visual impairments, hearing impairments. In accessibility, you had a specialist on all three, and we did the work with those three professionals. Now, even if you look at still students with disabilities, the spectrum of diagnosis goes all the way from, you know, a variety of medical conditions that are lifelong, all the way to um, you know, psychiatric disorders and lifelong psychiatric disorders with learning disabilities in the middle and all the rest. So if you worked in a targeted way with specialists, you would need literally a specialist on diagnosis that's, that spanned the entire spectrum of the DSM-5 and, and, and medical, medical conditions. You would need basically an army of professionals in your, in your accessible services to carry on doing the same kind of work. And obviously now diversity isn't just about accessibility. So also we're not touching even there on the fact that we also need specialists on what it's like to be racialized, what it's like to, um, to be uh, you know, an LGBT2S plus youth, um, and what it's like to be indigenous, what it's like to be you know, a second language learner, international learner. So um, those, that, that diagnostic approach is long gone in terms of, of pertinence and relevance. Sustainability as well, and I keep coming back to that. I was very lucky in the sense that I work, when I worked in accessibility, I was able to bridge and create collaborations with people in sustainability, and they liked our language and we liked their language. And I think it's a really important lens. And I like to take it back to three dimensions of sustainability. Obviously, the institutional ones we've already discussed in the two points ahead. You know, the systems are cracking, so it's not sustainable. But even if you look at department level, uh, individual departments of faculty are trying to handle this. It's not sustainable either. It's, a, it's, you know, putting out fires really at the moment. That's what we're seeing. There's a lot of administrative backup trying to solve problems after the problems have arisen. And there's already a, a, you know, a crisis or a problem with the students. And then when we look at uh, teachers and individual instructors, if we look at what I like to call the sustainability of teaching practices, they are long gone. Because if you talk to most instructors in the global north in the 21st century and you ask them, do you enjoy your job? They will say, no, I don't enjoy my job. And if you ask them why, I, I know I'm being prov provocative today, but it's the end of the day, we need to wake you up a little bit. So I'm not gonna spare my words. If you ask them why, they will say, because my day is peppered by again, this notion of putting out fires, by tension and stress with students that I'm trying to accommodate and I don't know how to accommodate them. Um, so that cannot work either. If we look at attrition and the loss of teacher of instructors, 
we are not, especially now that we're becoming teaching universities rather than research universities, we're not gonna be able to have live long satisfying careers if all we do is putting out files. We need to find new ways of teaching that actually enable us to do this in a, in a pleasing way and a satisfactory way. Um, the last point I want to touch on quickly is the theoretical perspective. And this is what I used to enter with, talking about the social model, right? So for those of you who are not familiar with the social model, it's basically a, a, a deconstruction of disability that sort of says, well, disability is not a label, it's not a characteristic of the person, it's really in the interaction. It's really when you have a certain embodiment and you have a design for the environment or the learning experience or so forth, that is not um, sufficiently diverse, sufficiently in inclusive, then you have a clash, you have a tension, and that's where disability is. So that's what we call the social model of disability. It's very popular in, in Scandinavia, so I'm sure most of you have heard of it. Um, so that has been problematic too, that for a long time, in, you know, for certainly in North America, for 30 years, we've been talking about the social model, but what we do isn't social model. So we have a complete dichotomy, a complete gap between what we say and what we do. And that needs to be resolved because it's, it's again, making it impossible to continue. The last point is the learner voice. So a lot of tension, as I said, between institutional culture and practices and student voice and student expectation, it's never been greater. The eloquence of students is unprecedented. We have students, certainly in North America, that are going to, um, you know, as far as Supreme Courts to make a point. Um, you know, I'll give you a quick example, but I think anecdotes really feed um, presentations like this. One of the last uh, sort of uh, files I dealt with um, when I was at McGill was a student with a visual impairment, uh, uh, you know, a medium visual impairment, who um, was supposed to take her finals in a gym, you know, with everyone else, and she needed enlarged text. She wrote to us saying, I need the enlarged text. I don't want to go to accessible services for exam. I'd like to sit exams with all my peers but I need enlarged text to be sent there. We said no problem, but then the VP of students said, no, we can't do that. And the whole you know, sort of systems kicked in. Um, exam services said, no, we can't do that. If it's in the gym, it has to be the regular script. You know, what she, she escalated, escalated this till it landed on the desk of the president of the university. And the president of the university had to say, okay, we're backing down. Yes, we are gonna send enlarged text to, to a gym while the student's taking finals. Um, and, you know, these are really um, common okay, occurrences now in institutions where students um, feel so strongly about their needs and their, and their views on inclusion that they're ready to force the topic and really go all the way. So for all of these reasons, these five reasons, we, you know, the system is broken. Uh, and again, I'm trying to be uh, controversial today and to, to you know, to, to, to be thought provoking. But I think really, if you take the time to talk about this in your institutions, you will see that at all level, we're confronted with this and we have a broken down system. Um, I really quickly want to also talk about um, inclusion and, and to talk about back to basics. Um, I know Eleanor was keen on my talking about this because I've talked about it on, on other occasions, particularly at the head in Ireland. Um, we need to acknowledge the fact that when we talk about inclusion, we talk about a lot of things. There's a lot of different justifications for the discourse that we have on inclusion. We don't actually usually mean the same thing, um, and we have very different ways of getting there. So I think it's worth stopping for just a couple of minutes to really show that this is problematic in higher ed as well, because it's a mixed bag of things. And really, people talk about it, you know, inclusion for, for on, on varying background with very different tools looking to achieve very different goals. So if you look traditionally, I'm only gonna spend a minute on this, but if you look traditionally at the literature on inclusion, really it's been three types of models so far, personalized learning, individualized learning, and differentiated instructions. The first one is very easy and they all define slightly differently. The first one, personalized learning is alternate delivery and modified assessment. This has been very popular, for example, in schools for um, learners with intellectual disability. So when the student needs to be included for social reasons, but is unable to actually reach the objectives. Uh, and that's what we've traditionally called personalized learning. Now that gets a little complicated because in universities now you have certain um, scholars starting to talk about personalized learning in terms of online instruction, but they actually assign a very different uh, meaning to that. But if we look really at the, the frameworks of inclusion, that's what we mean. So personalized learning inadequate for higher ed because we're unwilling to modify assessment. There are a few programs in the US that actually integrate students with intellectual disabilities into uh, regular mainstream programs, but they're very few and far between, and they generate a lot of controversy. Because essentially in higher ed, we are a selective competitive program. We don't actually argue the fact that higher ed is a universal um, sort of um, right for everyone, that you do have some gatekeeping there. So we, uh, that, that model hasn't been uh, really appropriate or pertinent. Individualized learning, 
is this notion that uh, we need remedial interventions from outside of the classroom often, but we don't modify the outcomes and, and the assessment. So this is what we see in schools, in a lot of K-12 schools, and it's also what we've had so far in higher ed. It's, uh, you know, accommodations approach because the class remains the same and then the learner is supported elsewhere. As I've said ahead just before, this is not really suitable for higher ed because the system is cracking. The last one, which has been tempting in the last few years, has been differentiated instruction. So if you go back to Tomlinson and so forth, she talks about differentiated instruction. It's the only model really that has been around so far, and I'm going to argue that it's not so um, convincing or, or appealing for higher ed, because really what you're asking an instructor, so what Tomlinson says is that really we should all walk into our classrooms, assess the needs of the students in just-in-time manner, and then juggle our outcomes quickly and create multiple pathways in the moment and then still get all of our students within the three hours to the same outcomes. Now, in K-12, it has been popular. It's still, I find, very difficult in K-12. It's easy for experienced teachers who are older in their career, but for young and novice teachers, it's very hard. But for higher ed instructors, it's actually been very frustrating because whenever people talk about differentiated instruction, well, how, who do you know in higher ed who can walk into a room, assess the needs of 120 students if that's the size class, sometimes it's larger, and then in a just-in-time fashion, create different pathways to get to the same goal. The format just doesn't work in higher ed, right? We're not talking about the same numbers. We don't have the students for the same amount of time. We don't necessarily um, have the skills to assess their needs. And also they are adults and they're not likely to want to disclose what their needs are. So we're talking about an entirely different uh, setup. And for that reason, differentiated instruction has been a bit of this wishful thinking when we've told instructors do it, but it's impossible to do. So I needed to stop for just three minutes to recap on this and to show you that this again adds to the notion that the system is broken and the alternatives that we're offering the, the uh, institutions are not great at the moment. They're not appealing, right? Nothing really functional or sustainable. Um, so, you know, this is in essence looking at the future. We need something. And before I try to sell universal design to you, I really want to recap because you may have other alternatives. I'm wanting to keep this talk very open-ended, but what we need in this landscape is approaches that are whole class and that do not require the learner to go elsewhere. Right, because we want to reduce the pressure on accessibility services or on other support services. So support for international students, support for indigenous students and so forth. We're trying to want to do this inclusion in the classroom. Um, why do we want to do this in the classroom? Because it's an, usually an, an essential part of how we see inclusion because we want diverse learners to be able to create and develop social capital. That's one of the key and um, key aspects, the cornerstone aspects of inclusion. We want them to be able to network and create those, those connections in the same way as any other students. So in that respect, this inclusion has to be done in the classroom because we want to avoid them being labeled and then being stigmatized. So that's the second requirement. We also want to uh, not create pressure on faculty to carry out tasks that they are not able to do, that they don't have the competency for, such as what I've just discussed, differentiated instruction. So identifying needs, addressing needs in the moment, because instructors are going to tell you they don't, they can't do that in higher ed. They're not equipped to do that. We also need a model that respects our human rights protection. So I know in Norway, I, the legislation around, uh, you know, inclusive design is very loose. But I assume that you have the same laws that we all have that date back from the 70s that at least just, you know, sort of um, guarantee non-discrimination. That's basically the basic human rights setup, right? That at the, in the essence of it, we have to ensure that no one is discriminated against. And then it's not very clear in each jurisdiction how we do that, but that's the, the basic um, pr principle. So we need a system that also still um, respects that and implements that. Um, we also, um, yeah, sorry, so I, um, I finished that. So this is where UDL becomes appealing. Uh, because it responds uh, to all of these specific variables. Um, so how do we define it? It's a sustainable approach to the inclusion of diverse learners, uh, which allows campuses uh, to, or encourages campuses to, appro to approach uh, and adopt a design approach that translates the social model into classroom practices. Right, I talked about the social model saying, you know, uh, disability isn't uh, in the person, it's in that interaction. This quickly lead you on to think, well, okay, so if it's not in the person, it's in the way I design. So we have to shift from a discourse that looks at the exceptionality of learners 
to a discourse that looks at the barriers that are created in the environment. So that could be the resources, could be the, the classroom practices and so forth. So the shift to the barriers analysis is really important because it's going to be, it's going to be relevant and pertinent to students with, with disabilities, but also to all the full spectrum of students, right? As I said, second language learners, international students, first generation students are usually going to report exactly the same barriers. It's not no longer about their exceptionality, which is varied, but it's actually about the barriers which they encounter in learning. And that is actually a common denominator. And once you do this exercise with different groups, you realize they mention the same things. It's the same barriers that come up. So UDL is going to be useful in the sense that it's not going to tackle and focus on the variability of the learner. It's going to actually focus on those barriers and how we can, as a system and as institutions, think ahead and hypothesize as to what barriers students might encounter and then work through design thinking at eliminating those barriers ahead of time. Uh, it's very useful because it's going to enable you to do this, uh, and it comes up on the slide somewhere else. Yes, just below, actually. It, to do this in your downtime, because you're working at the blueprint level, you're not working in the moment. We're not asking people to do unrealistic things. We're not asking an instructor to change the design the night before they give a lecture. We're not trying to change something the, the minute before we offer an, an assessment. We're really asking people to redesign and use a design lens and to think about barriers which might be present in that downtime, basically. So as they are creating a course, as they are redesigning a course, as they're starting a new year, as they are revising or reviewing their assessment, as they are choosing resources. That's why you try and catch them in higher ed. You try and catch them in those times when they are actually planning and designing, and then you try and offer them a lens for inclusive design. And that's what UDL tries to do. So it's fairly uh, useful in that sense. It's also cost effective because we need to keep that, that card in, in place. Again, we work in a neoliberal environment. We can't just ignore it. And uh, it is uh, important that, that we, uh, we keep that in mind because uh, you know, your senior administrations are gonna say, well, is this really sustainable? It is sustainable because you're taking back inclusion to the classroom. So you're reducing the reliance and the pressure on all of the support services. Uh, it doesn't mean that they're going to disappear, right? Sometimes it's a fear that we have some accessibility services. You are still going to have the exceptional learner who has, you know, an extraordinary or exceptional um, impairment and needs a, a whole um, suite of services. But those are going to be the, ex you know, we're going to go back to those numbers from the 70s. You're going to be dealing with, you know, a percent less than a percent of your campus instead of dealing with, you know, uh, 30, 40, 50 percent of your campus. So it really reduces costs. It's much more effective and sustainable. Uh, it's also um, doesn't make an abstraction of this neoliberal landscape that we're in, but on the contrary, it works within it. Because again, if you ask an instructor to do unrealistic thing in an unrealistic amount of time, you've all mentioned time, you know, there's been at least five instances when you've talked about time. We are under pressure in terms of resources, we are under pressure in terms of um, you know, how much we can do. So this allows you um, to, to think about inclusion within these parameters. So you're gonna be able to do this when you can do this. I'll give you an example. I try to use UDL and to have that inclusive lens in all my teaching, but last year I was due to go back to my all campus on PI and teach in a really intensive course for two weeks in the summer. I plan to be back on, P on, on, on Prince Edward Island for the summer and to teach two courses back to back, 40 hour courses at graduate level, um, two first weeks of July. Then COVID happened and I taught those two courses online. So you can imagine the pleasure of pivoting two 40 hour courses to in one week, two online. Um, and also to not just do this in your own time zone, but do this in a time zone that's four time zones away, right? So when the students are up at eight in the morning, ready to go, it's actually four in the morning for me. Uh, so that was the, the fun thing that I did in my, in my two weeks of, of pivoting for, for COVID. Now, did I, was I able to do UDL in that, in, in that space? No, because, uh, because of the fact that we were online, because of COVID, because of uh, the redesign, because of all this, I actually did very, very little UDL in those two courses. So, you know, it, UDL is, is, is interesting in a sense that it enables you to, to acknowledge and recognize the pressures that you have around you. It doesn't mean that in the next course I came back to, I didn't suddenly realize the pockets of time that I had to think about design and inclusive design and to go back to UDL. But it does mean that as an agent in neoliberal environments, we are able with UDL to, to be flexible and to, you know, do it when we can and then say, okay, well, that's too bad. I can't do it this time. But still to look at this progression towards inclusion as a spectrum, lifelong spectrum across your career, which means that you, you can continue doing it 
it doesn't matter if you missed it out here, you can go back to it and continue that work throughout your career as a lifelong sort of development. Lastly, it's also not prescriptive. And this is really important in higher education uh, because a lot of models are trying to say, you know, do this or do that. Um, we are in an environment that is multi-layered. It's very varied in, in, in both in the competencies that we teach, in the level at which we teach them, and then the classroom format as well. If you think about it, higher ed is not just about lecture hall. We have art studios, we have um, labs, science lab, we have language labs. We have all sorts of environments that are not conventional. And so we need a model that can actually be used in different environments. And that's the beauty of UDL is that really it's just a lens. It's not a checklist. It's not about the, the result. It's actually a lens on your own practice to try and be as inclusive as you can and remove as many barriers as you can in your interaction with the learner, which means that you could have two different faculty working in different environments who apply um, UDL to the same problem, the same barrier, which they've encountered, but they come up with different solutions depending on their expertise or the prior um, you know, experience with inclusion of the clientele that they have in front of them at the level that they're teaching undergrad versus graduate uh, of the subject con or the content matter that they're teaching, they may actually end up in different design solution. And that's totally fine. This is really important because in higher ed, if you try and push a model top down, you're gonna hit a wall because the first thing that we argue as environment is that we are varied and also we have academic, uh, you know, academic in, uh, freedom. So we can actually do things the way we want. So any system that we're trying to uh, integrate into a higher ed in terms of inclusion needs to have that flexibility, which means that people are, need to be able to do things the way they want to do it. And that's particularly where UDL is useful because it is just a lens and enables people to do that. Um, so we're back to a bit of, uh, we've got about uh, 40 minutes left. I want to take some time to think of, to talk about the, the current context as well before we go on to the strategic and organizational challenge. So I did want to, um, to, um, to survey you there again and uh, to um, debate whether you feel that in the global health crisis, um, this situation has increased the focus on accessibility. So has it been positive? Or has it been negative and has it actually um, have accessibility and inclusion suffered in the current climate? So I'm going to pick, pick up the activity, if you give me just one minute, and generate a code. This is going to be a simple uh, poll. So we'll see in all the participants uh, what percentage feels one way or the other. And then I'll build on that. So the code is 56, 34, 88, 02. So I'll say it again, 56, 34, 8802. I'll say it again in single digits uh, while you're voting. 56348802. So you have two options there. Do you feel that it has increased the focus in a positive way, or do you think it's been detrimental and that uh, inclusion and accessibility have suffered in the current climate? Really interesting uh, uh, sort of reflection. I've done this with lots of groups, and you get to very different uh, results. I'll give you a few minutes to vote. I can tell you as well that in terms of the scholarship, I've got a couple of references in, this, in the table that you might want to look at. Uh, the, the scholarship's pretty, uh, and the press as well, it's pretty divided on this. And you've got about half the, half the literature that argues one way and half the literature that argues the other way. So I think it's still a mood question. Obviously we're still in sort of pandemic, post pandemic, and we'll have to wait a little bit till we actually assess this. I have the feeling that the, the dilemma and the dichotomy will continue in the scholarship and that we will see people still arguing uh, one or the other um, and, and that um, you know, we won't come to an agreement as to what, uh, what's the impact of that. So far, we've got about 23 people have voted and 16 feel that it has actually increased the focus on accessibility and seven feel that, that um, accessibility and inclusion have suffered during the pandemic. And the proportion seems to be staying right. So I'll give you another few minutes and see how many people are voting and then we'll move from there. Yeah, so it seems in a group that more people um, feel that um, it's been positive in a sense and that there's been an increased focus on accessibility versus people who feel that it's been detrimental. Uh, we are gonna see this dichotomy because we can all find um, anecdotal arguments um, to show that both are correct. 
um, you know, um, there's been people arguing both sides, and you will see, um, as I said, anecdotal evidence and to, to a certain degree, some research evidence that um, both uh, are correct. And I think this is exactly what it showed is that really it has showed that um, it's a disrupted landscape where we don't have easy solution. And I think that's the takeaway from this in this discussion. It's been a particularly uh, troubling um, sort of moment for inclusion and accessibility because to a certain extent before that we were in long term processes with well established procedures. We had a clear vision of what was accessible and wasn't accessible and now we've lost this. We are in a, what I would call a just in time format where a lot of things can be either way. They could be um, you know, good for accessibility and inclusion and it could be negative for accessibility and inclusion. Frederick? Uh, and there's lots of reason for this. Um, so I, I say here that much lies in the detail. I'll give you an example. Frederick? I have a lot of colleagues, for example, who during the pivot started doing uh, the flipped classroom. For those of you who are not familiar with it, the flipped classroom is basically an environment where you try and use the time that you have for interaction with your learners, um, use it optimally and to maximize its effect by um, doing really interactive work. So whatever is not interactive work, so whatever is traditional transfer in quotes of uh, information. So, um, you know, actually um, the sort of lecturing that we sometimes do. So giving people resources, introducing concepts, uh, giving them example, all of that is not seen as terribly interactive. So it's done before the class. So usually through online resources. Frederick? And then, yeah. Yeah, there you can hear me. Good. Uh, there's a question here, and I thought it, it was connected to the mentee you had. Um, okay. Do you think if, um, if you ask for barriers, don't you think there's a risk to find more barriers than actually present? Um, let me see if I understand the question correctly. If you ask for barriers, is there in a, in a specific context of COVID? Do you think the question is, or is this a general question? No, it's a general one, but but yeah, so not just directly connected to Menti, but it was um, if you think um, if you ask for barriers, then you mm -hmm. probably will find more. Well, that's that's something we think then, at least. Yeah, yeah, I can see that, and, yeah. and definitely when you look at the process of of inclusive design, the process of UDL. And you say to people, okay, you go back to the blueprint and you hypothesize about possible barriers. Um, so the danger there, I think the question would be, is there a risk that you actually um, see or identify barriers that are not necessarily barriers that are actually experienced by the learners? It's a possibility, but don't forget that, um, you know, inclusion is a bit of a lottery. We know there's a high percentage of diverse learners in the classroom. We don't necessarily know uh, which one. So in a way, yes, you may identify all of the barriers and they may not always come up in the classroom, but once you've identified them in that blueprint work, it becomes a lot easier to remove them at that stage than to deal with them once you're in the classroom. Mm -hmm. That's really where UDL works, is to try and do the work proactively as opposed to reactively. Reactively is very time consuming, very resource intensive, and really creates issues with stigmatization, liberalization. So in terms of social capital. So really that's the argument that yes, we could wait and see what actually comes up, but the reactive work that happens then is much more complicated than when you do the work proactively and you sort of hypothesize before you come in, okay, I have a multitude of diverse learners. Let's look at what barriers are possible and let's remove them. Now, the other argument I would say there is that you may indeed go through that exercise and identify barriers that may not have been relevant to your class, but you still identified and you worked on them. Don't forget that if you see UDL as a sustainable lifelong work, it still means that you've now come up with a design tool that means that that barrier is no longer going to be in your courses. All right, I'll give you an example. I work a lot on the redesign of rubrics, for example. So if I teach a course, I will say, I don't really assess writing in every one of my assessments. So I'm going to have one assessment that, assess, that assesses academic writing but I'm gonna have other assessments that actually um, just assess other competencies. So when I do the rubrics for these other assessments, I remove the word writing and I leave the choice to the learner in which way they want to actually present uh, their submission. Uh, if I do that work at the, pre, at the proactive level and the blueprint level, yes, I may walk into a classroom for that semester where the students were fairly happy to be doing written work and they didn't necessarily need that alternative choice. But having gone through that reflection and having included that flexibility, 
it's not a work that I have to do again. I've worked on those rubrics. They are now um, you know, flexible enough to enable any student to choose work from a strength-based perspective and choose what works for them, which means that now that rubric is gonna be used again and again and again in my courses without me having even to think of changing and doing that redesign work. So I think that would be the answer to your question. Yes, you may identify more barriers than are relevant in this instance, but if you look at it in, in lifelong career trajectory, you are then removing barriers it's the work is on you, the work is not on them. So you're becoming more and more inclusive. You're progressing on that spectrum towards having a, uh, you know, practices that are more and more inclusive, inject more and more flexibility and more and more sustainable. And you don't have to go back and forth in that work. That work just progresses regardless of who you have in front of you. And that works because then it reduces the friction and the frustration. So I hope, I hope that, that, that helped answer that question. Going back quickly to um, the COVID um, situation. So in this climate, I think what you've seen, again, I was talking about the flipped classroom. So a lot of people have pivoted to the flipped classroom. Um, if you look at the flipped classroom, it's a debate I often have. People say, oh yes, it's really inclusive. It's really accessible. Because again, if you look at the design perspective, you realize that we have a lot of students in the classrooms who don't like to be passive in their learning. They don't like to be um, you know, in the lecture, just listening and taking notes. So the flipped classroom is the you know, the, the paroxysm of the change because suddenly the students are never taking notes. They're never listening. They're doing all that beforehand. They're coming into the classroom and they're active, they discuss, they problem solve, they talk with the instructor. It's incredibly powerful for those, for those learners. So if you look at removing barriers, it has removed a lot of barriers for a lot of students, but it has created barriers for a lot of other students. There's a lot of students, diverse students, who find the flipped classroom very, um, even trauma inducing to be honest because if you are uh, someone who is on the autism spectrum uh, you're going to find this very tough if you're an introvert simply you're going to find this very tough if you're a second language learner international students you're going to find this very tough because your oral um, skills are not maybe up to to the uh, to power to be talking all the time you know through three hour lectures so it's a typical example of a practice that could really sit on the edge. It could be very inclusive. It could not be inclusive and create more barriers. So the detail is in the arts. And in this instance, for example, there is nothing wrong with an instructor every so often using the flipped classroom because it motivates the students which otherwise would be lost. It gives them uh, an incentive. It gives them occasions to shine and demonstrate their, their skills and their competencies. It creates that alternative that really uh, you know, might be the lifesaver for some of the learners that don't do well in traditional learning. But at the same time, if you don't use it all the time, you don't um, marginalize other learners, you don't penalize those who find it tough, they have to develop their competency, but they also have a lot of other opportunities to work in the traditional format, which they like. So you see the art is in the detail. And in the COVID crisis, what we've seen is a lot of instructors trying new things, and trying them overnight, right? So the opposite of what we've seen so far, people actually not having time for reflection, jumping in and saying, I feel that I can't just do what I was doing in a new format, I'm gonna try all these new things. And they've tried new things and they haven't always had the, the, the time to assess whether it's, inclu it's inclusive or not. In comparison, to, you know, in parallel to this, we also have accessibility services confronted with the same thing. So either just not even aware of what's going on in the classroom or confronted with new uh, approaches that they've never had time to think about and um, having to support staff in a just-in-time fashion, so often with no time. So having to say to someone, is that okay for me to do that tomorrow? I don't know, I have to think about it. Well, there's no time to think about it, instructors going ahead. So that's what we've seen during uh, the COVID crisis. There's a lot of experimentation, a lot of really interesting things happening, but the art has always been in the detail. So the instructor now has to decide often overnight, really what I call just-in-time, whether something is accessible and is inclusive or not. And they often don't have support from other services to actually um, discuss this and assess this. Uh, so you see how UDL is going to be useful because the old way of saying, okay, hang on, you might have an accommodation for this. Okay, hang on, and setting up a bag, you know, a, a retroactive retrofitting process where you can have access to something if this is not inclusive is no longer working. Now, add to that the fact that also uh, instructors are increasing, increasingly isolated in this landscape. They work from home. They feel away from the campus, away from services. They have limited contacts in this pandemic with uh, support services. This has come to a point where there's heightened pressure on instructors to decide in the moment, is this something good? Is this something inclusive? Is this not inclusive? And to come up with a way of supporting that reflection. That's where UDL is going to be really useful because again, it's a lens and it's gonna be the only ultimate guide 
as to whether something is good or not good for accessibility and in what proportion and in which way exactly should I implement? Because it's gonna enable people to go back to that barriers analysis. It's creating barriers, it's removing barriers, to what extent is doing both, to what extent can I integrate this into a mixed variety of practices in my classroom? So just wanted to, uh, to stress this, but I think it's it really, if you look at it, it's an incredible opportunity to um, sell UDL. Uh, if you're looking at a campus and trying to say, well, I want to develop this and really to build a community of practice, this, is, oh, this has been an incredible opportune time to do this. Um, so I think it, it's really important that you seize that. So I've got about uh, just a few minutes, we're getting into question time, but I do want to, um, to talk about strategic uh, implementation too. I think it would be naive just to demonstrate the benefits of UDL and leave it there and says, okay, implementation is gonna be easy. Over the last 10 years, we have seen a lot of false, what I call false starts in higher ed, especially in North America. We've seen a lot of people start uh, communities of practice, individual um, instructors, whole departments, whole institution, try UDL and get nowhere. And that can be really bad for this reflection because often people will then say, well, why should we try? Because look, this failed here, this failed here. The reason why it's failed when you look at it is not because of the benefits of UDL or the value of the model itself. It's because of the organizational approach that's been taken to it. So we forget that higher education institutions are large, what I like to call large, complex, multi-layered, multifaceted. We are a huge, we, can, we, can, we, you know, we talked about learner diversity, but in higher ed, we have a huge um, sort of staff diversity. We come from different backgrounds. We have different training. We have different theoretical approaches. We are not homogeneous in any way. So when you're trying to create change in environments like this, you are going to have to think deep about the complex processes that are um, started. There has generally been, when you look at um, UDL implementations in the last 10 years, a lack of strategic reflection. People have basically jumped in and said, this is great, let's do this. Well, it doesn't work like this in organizational change. Uh, and it's led to a lot of problems. So frequent mistakes has been over-reliance on accessibility services. It's problematic because first of all, you're asking people who are working, if you look at it and objectively and in the kindest of way, I've been an accessibility staff, so it's not a criticism, but, but accessibility services are still working from a medical model approach. It's a very medical model in the sense of it's based on diagnosis, it's, um, you know, your funding is linked to diagnosis. You need that documentation. So all of those processes are very medical model based. So you're asking these units that are working medical model to suddenly work from a social model uh, way. It doesn't work, right? They're not the best advocate. They're going to find friction at all points in their work because they're really nothing that they do predisposes them to do this work very effectively. So dumping UDL on accessibility services has been a big problem because they really don't have the time, they don't work within a structure that allows it, and really uh, it ends up making them really feel conflicted. So they're not going to be the best um, sort of advocates around campus. Um, what I would argue is that really we need something fresh, and I keep arguing that we need to look at ecological theory. So you know when you look at Bronfen Brenner, most of you must be used to it. We've used it a lot in community work, social work, in education. We put uh, the individual at the middle, and we look at all the systems around and how they interact and how all these interactions actually create what we see, right? Create, the, for example, the, the behavior that's manifested or the approach. But um, ecological uh, theory is used more and more in management now in organizational change. And if you put the unit in the middle, right? So I want to give UDL to the teaching and learning unit, right? Put them in the middle, and then it enables you to diagram what kind of relationship that does unit have in what is, to be honest, a very political landscape. Most of our higher education is a very politicized landscape. So to map out the relationship that that unit has, and then to be able to see, well, are they gonna be able to work with UDL? What kind of natural alliances do they have? Which other stakeholders are they connected to? How is this gonna impact the, the strength of the discourse? So I think this is leading now people to this second wave of work on UDL, where people are being much more strategic uh, using that ecological lens, trying to plan ahead, who's going to do this, who's going to have ownership, how is it going to be shared? And this is, you know, we still have to see on the ground what's going to happen, but I think it's leading more and more institutions now to consider the fact that this should be shared ownership. It should really be about bringing together a multitude of people, particularly teaching and learning units, um, senior administration, accessible to services, definitely as partners, but not as the main uh, stakeholder. Um, student voice as well, very important that we have student voice. If the students need to understand what we're trying to do, they need to be represented, they need to have their say. 
um, and, and faculty themselves, right? So having all of these um, sort of these stakeholders around some sort of committee, some sort of table, but it has to be shared, shared um, sort of empowered sort of ownership over the model. And that's how we are gonna get towards successful implementation. Um, so really complex, ecological, um, deep thinking before the act, before you move on to implementation, you know, planning it. And as we see from organizational change, good successful change is planned. Uh, you look at the factors of resistance you're going to uh, meet and you address them. You monitor the change, you debrief on the change, you lead your change process to the end. We're not great at doing that in higher education. Well, we do a lot of wishful thinking, a lot of let's do this and we're starting tomorrow. So uh, I would encourage as a call to action that we do a lot more reflection around this. So I'm closing up. Um, I'm going to put those up, those suggestions, but talk to them and then quickly move on to questions uh, from the audience. Um, but this, I'll leave it up because really it's just a summary of what we've discussed. Um, the last one I do want to, to, to pick up just on the last um, point, which we didn't address um, massively, is the funding model. So sometimes uh, you will have resistance in campuses by people saying, oh, but the funding model doesn't allow for that. Yes. But also, certainly in North America, if you look at the highest level of, gov of governance, uh, you know, within government and, and so forth, you have an intention which is clear now to say that the funding for inclusion is obsolete. Governments know this. They've been uh, most governments in North America, you know, jurisdictions at state or provincial level have been saying we need to change our model. So the intention is there. The acknowledgement that the funding is obsolete is there. We are going to definitely go to a different model of funding. Um, it's so you have to explain to people that there's no point in being defensive. It's almost like you're sitting on two chairs. You are on the old model, but you need to move to the new model. It's not gonna happen overnight. You need to think about how can I do what I do with the current funding, knowing that the funding is changing. And that can be problematic within institutions. Uh, but we do need to keep this in mind because otherwise the risk is that we still sit on the old chair and we haven't started moving to the new chair when those funding change happen. Uh, and in essence, that funding changes usually instead of funding per capita and saying, you know, you're getting so much money for students who need specific services to start saying, well, we know that so and such and such percentage of your campus requires um, support. We're going to give you funding that's based on this general rule that such a percentage of your campus, any campus requires, uh, you know, work on inclusion. And that, 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 that funding doesn't necessarily have to go to support services, but can actually go to proactive work with faculty and to development about structures, right? So it's also that shift saying it doesn't have to be in, into retrofitting. It can actually go to proactive redesign. So I'm going to leave it there. I've got a few references for you there. And I'm going to see with Eleanor if we have questions in the five minutes we have left. Yeah. <clears throat> yes, Frederick, thank you. Um, <clears throat> we got some questions. Um, how about the black screens people hiding in digital learning? Okay or not? And any UDL solution to this? Okay. Do you want to give me all the questions or just the one? No, at a time? no, one at a time. I think that's okay. best. Um, I think in in you know again this is the one question that you should look at within that um, that slides when I said you know it, it's an, a just in time now assessment of what is um, what is um, you know positive and negative. I think right away you need to break that up. I don't think there is a, a design solution that works in every context. Now every instructor in their own context might see whether. Um, insisting on something is really relevant in the reflection that they're doing on, on the, you know, on reflection. Look, with the numbers that you have today, if I said to everyone, I want to see everyone on screen, would that have changed the presentation? Not necessarily, because I would have so much, I really can't see anything. Mm -hmm. um, if I'm in a class of 50 and I say, I want to see you all on screen, because that's how you assess engagement. Really? That's how you assess engagement. I think you have a lot of work to do on UDL and design in terms of engagement. Um, and what you construe as being engagement. And then, you know, so it's all about backwards design, right? So I'm going, what are you trying to achieve? What are you trying to assess? What are you trying mm. to teach? And then is this part of that reflection? Um, in this case, you know, there may be small classes where indeed you are, you have specific requirements and you want the students to be engaged. Therefore you are maybe going to ask them to get out of black screen and to actually um, have a voice and be present. But if all you do is lecture, and you're asking people to be present, then that's like the old participation grade, right? You're in my classroom, your body, so I'm giving you 10%. Well, I think we need to dig there. The problem isn't even design. The problem is really about core objective. What are we teaching? What are we assessing? Uh, you know, some of this, I'm going to be controversial again, but some of those practices are, make no sense whatsoever. You sat your, you know, your, your bottom, I'll be 
I'd be polite. Your bottom in a chair and I give you 10%. I don't have any evidence that you were engaged. It doesn't give me any clue as what you were thinking about, or whether you actually uh, took part in the you know, core out, uh, outcomes of the course. So sometimes that black screen turns to this, right? I think we need to deconstruct that and go back to what are we trying to teach, what are we trying to assess, and then have that inclusive design lens in that process. And that will change from class to class, instructor to instructor, depending on the outcomes, the class size, what you're trying to do, and also, and so forth. Mm. Yes, okay, I think we'll have some time for the last question here. Um, mm. What do you think is the best activities and learning we can build on after the pandemic? Right. So I think I'm not going to answer that in terms of, you know, anecdotal um, do this or do that, but I think we are in a great position. And that's really where, you know, going back to that poll that you did when, you know, in the end, two thirds of you thought it was uh, had increased visibility around accessibility and inclusion and one third thought it had been negative. I think whichever way we think, we have to think that this has been an incredible opportune time mm -hmm. because even people who were reluctant to think of their job as being designers, of a learning experience have now had no choice but to accept that yes indeed they are designers of the learning experience i haven't met one single colleague that hasn't now acknowledged the fact that yes what i do in terms of design matters now some of them have realized this in an incredibly negative way by you know going from mistake to mistake and and realizing the negative impact of what they do others have been happily surprised by trying a few things and seeing the huge impact that positive design can have and inclusive design can have on the outcomes and the relationship with the learner. So I think the opportunity, opportunity that we have is that whether their experience has been negative or positive, most stakeholders on campuses, and I would take this further to student services as well. I think anyone who interacts with students and has done this during pandemic has realized the incredible role they have as designers to enable and support students or to disable students and create mm. barriers that are insurmountable. So we need to really hone in on that, on that experience and make people, now that they've accepted the fact that yes, they have that hat and they are designers, how can we support you in becoming inclusive designers? Mm. Because that's what everyone wants to be. I don't think there's anyone out there who is happy being a bad designer of experience. Mm. They would like to be inclusive designers, but they don't always know how. Um, so that's where we can jump in and use that opportunity to really say, well, look, whether you talk about inclusive design, you talk about UDL, but you know, everything that we've discussed today, this is useful. This is the lens that you need. This is what's going to support you in accepting that role and making sure you use that role positively in a way that's sustainable and constructive for the future. So I hope that answers that question. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much. I see the clock is ticking now, so I'm afraid we need to end the Q&A session for That's today, right. but I know that you, as you said yourself as well, uh, you are an active Twitter user. So, I am. so if you if you want more questions, you're available during. Absolutely, yeah. Just use the the as we've said the hashtag, uh, yeah. which is Universal, Universal 2021. Yeah. And you can use my uh, my handle too, so F Fove. Um, and then if you link both, I will monitor all the all the rest of my morning and the day, and I can continue conversations and answering some of your questions on that. That'd be a pleasure. Yeah, great. Thank you so much. Nice being with <laughs> you. And I'm sorry I can't be there physically, but it's been a lot of fun. <laughs>